Uh, can you hear me? Is, is it okay? Up just a little more and let me put my monitor up so I can see how I'm framed. And, uh, so I was playing around over here until the monitor got suppressed. A little bit more are you in Skype. Okay. I think this should be okay. Uh, this way, yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, my uh, first question is, uh, what do you think? Why did Trump uh, decided to uh, blow off uh, from the who World Health Organization? Why he decided to do that? Okay. First of all, the uh, the pandemic itself, in terms of producing a government response, very complex set of problems. Uh, clearly, one where there's been some preparation, both you know at, at the national level, for most you know developed countries also at the international level, but very complex problems. Um, politics in an election year in the United States, um, international relations, international politics, for example, relations between the U.S. and China, which have been very complex uh, since President Trump got elected with the renegotiation of a lot of business deals. Um, so many other layers of complexity. And then you go to the United Nations, which People like to treat the United Nations as if it were, you know, something out of heaven where the rules of the rest of the world do not apply, politics don't enter into it, big money doesn't enter into it. But in fact, it's an international bureaucracy that reflects the state of affairs in the rest of the world. I know from my own personal experience as a journalist that there are some positions when captured on tape with the translation audio are very easily accessible right after a Security Council meeting. Say, for example, the position of the United States representative on something happening in Syria. Uh, there are others that take a couple of days to get out and miss the news cycle. That would be, for example, say the Syrian permanent representative when they have a discussion on Syria. Well, the World Health Organization is an organ of the United Nations, and it reflects this kind of you know, power uh, relations internally and it's a bureaucracy that precedes the Trump administration. And so the institutional hostility that you've seen towards Trump's administration by the other powers inside the United States is very well reflected uh, with the World Health Organization as well. Certainly, if I were Trump, I would assume that that were true, and I would be positioning myself to engage in a battle if it comes to pass. And so I think what's happening is they're positioning for a confrontation should it happen uh, over certain things so that Trump doesn't feel he can be uh, exposed as incompetent by an authority like the WHO. I see. So uh, you think uh, it is um, a good way to behave uh, in this situation of, of pandemic and, and so on? Well, the problem is that you know we come to this crisis wearing the clothes that we were wearing when the crisis occurred. Uh, the international situation is, to be gentle, chaotic, hostile, dangerous. Um, if you look just at the relative uh, budgets in the United States for a military as opposed to medical uh, concerns, you know, the United States spends much more money on nuclear weapons than it does in uh, preventive epidemiology, for example. And so we walk into the crisis that way. We walk into the crisis with the fight that's going on uh, with the U.S. and China over various economic concessions that the U.S. government is seeking to extract and the negotiations back from China, which also has its own interests. Um, the, the difficulties between the U.S. and Russia, the difficulties between the U.S. and uh, Western Europe and the difficulties that the U.S. has created with the NATO countries and Russia – you know, and on and on and on. This is a precondition to this crisis. You don't suddenly wave a magic wand and all of the power relations and the fighting and wrangling go away in service to humanity. You would hope that that would be true. But, you know, the, the nature of the people involved and the nature of the institutions is betrayed by the fact that we're just in that position. There are many more people that die of hunger, for example, 
than are dying or will die of, of this coronavirus. And the problem could be much more cheaply solved and much less intrusive a solution to it. And it's yet, you know, been bedeviling us for hundreds of years because no one's taking the time to do it. So, you know, there are many motivations behind the actions that are being taken right now also that one might want to, you know, take a look at context and say, well, if we're going to solve this problem, why haven't we solved these other problems? And I'm hoping that after this crisis is over, because it should be resolved, it's dangerous. I don't want to downplay that at all. But once it is resolved, that people look at the other problems around them with a new eye and say, you know what, if we could save 30 or 40,000 potential victims of a coronavirus, how about saving 9 million victims of starvation this year? Because that's how many died last year of starvation in the world. So, um, and um, why do you think China is uh, trying to make, oh, to, I'm sorry, why do you think the U.S., uh, Trump, trying to make China a guilty uh, in this uh, whole situation with virus? Uh, is it uh, um, a part of this uh, war between U.S. and China? Okay, you have... Um like a, a three-pole game that's been going on really since uh, the end of World War II, um, and particularly since the Chinese Revolution in 1949, uh, with the U.S. and NATO under whatever form it existed at the time. Um, the old Soviet bloc, you know, Russia basically and, and, and its allies, um, and uh, China and its allies. Um, The United States played the game that they played, dividing the uh, USSR and China in the 60s. Everyone who was involved played, played that game. It wasn't just the United States. But, you know, they, they, the U.S. did a reversal in the 60s, and you ended up where those two were divided, and they were each separately, uh, you know, challenged by, by the West. And who knows how to characterize that? But that was a strategy that was followed and was somewhat successful. There is... Um, You know, a different situation now, but one that's sort of uh, similar to that, um, particularly since the, uh, you know, the coup in Ukraine. The United States, uh, during the Obama administration, got particularly hostile towards both China and Russia simultaneously. Uh, they started, you know, all of that business in the South China Sea, uh, installed the THAAD missiles in uh, Korea, which clearly were targeting Russia and China, but particularly China. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, the trouble in Ukraine, they started doing war games in the Baltics and, you know, all of that happening simultaneously resulted in 2014 in a declaration by Russia and China of a strategic alliance, which just goes to follow. Each of them said, these guys look like they're getting ready to make war on us. We should probably stand together should that happen. And so that's the international condition right now that prevails still. And... We walk into this with the Trump administration having decided to target China um, as an economic power, uh, and there's been these heavy negotiations back and forth for you know a few years now, um, and and then suddenly this. Meanwhile, Trump is being targeted by domestic political adversaries as being responsible for this uh, coronavirus, which is ridiculous. Um, The anecdotal information and the original medical information that came in put the locus of uh, the original infections around Wuhan in China. And so Trump is basically pointing to China saying, look, it's them, not me. Uh, so that's like at the core of it. Um, and, you know, obviously uh, epidemiology is a much more complex uh, science than, uh, you know, than anecdotal political rhetoric and, and what we see on TV is the latter and, and not the former. Um, and so uh, what do you think will happen next? Uh, so Trump said that uh, he, he will put uh, sanctions uh, against China and uh, so what do you think about it? Uh, will it happen or not? I, I think that uh, President Xi And President Trump both know exactly what game they're playing. Um, and uh, I think that um, while the negotiations that are going on now uh, behind the scenes might get colored by 
uh, this claim of culpability uh, with respect to uh, the, the virus. I think everybody really knows that what's going on is when these negotiations are done, you know, the nature of the world has been shifting for the last few years already outside of before the Trump administration came in towards multipolarity. It's a natural tendency, really. You know, the, the, the bulk of the world's population lives outside the United States and Western Europe and Japan. You know, more than two thirds of the population lives outside of that area. Obviously, the two thirds of humanity is going to have at least an equal voice to that that's been wielded by the U.S. and NATO and, and et cetera. And the engine for this uh, is China's economy. China is the powerhouse in the you know, Eurasian behemoth that's you know, coming into birth. So that is the real target. Like the, the, what's the world going to be like as this develops of the negotiations with the U.S. and the political cover for it? Because they can't say that they're fighting with China and making prices go up at Walmart because they want to protect IBM or you know, some other American corporation. Politically, they can't say that here. Instead, it's going to be over the virus. It's going to be over dumping. It's going to be over you know, proprietary uh, rights to intellectual property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, do, um, do you think uh, it's going to um, influence Trump's rating? Uh, before the presidential elections? I, I'm reluctant to uh, make any predictions about how this is going to play out for the election. Going into the uh, crisis, the last polls, right before Bernie Sanders pulled out, showed that Bernie Sanders could win, maybe, Biden had no chance of winning, and, and none of the others had any chance of winning. That Trump was going to win the election, except maybe Sanders and a crisis. So immediately we have a crisis. I mean, it's just how it worked out. But the things that come down the street, you know, they, partly they're, they're perceived of the way they're first described by the first people seeing it. You know, here comes a monster down the street is what's called out. And then people look outside and there's a guy who's six foot ten. Well, everybody's thinking of him as a monster now, but he's not necessarily. But that's how you know this got, this got looked at by people right away. They were frightened by it, and so you know, depending on how this all works out, um, you know, Trump is going to be blamed for some of it. Maybe that's what everyone seems to be trying to do. The whole political establishment that Trump didn't act fast enough. He acted too fast. Um, he shut down too many things. He didn't shut down enough things. He's not shutting it down long enough, etc. And, you know, I think how people feel on Election Day about themselves and their lives, um, I think, is going to decide whether or not they vote for Trump or for whoever the other uh, candidate ends up being. Um, if they're doing OK, if things are back to normal, if they feel somewhat secure in their lives, usually they reelect. And if they feel insecure and, and frightened and the people in power are the ones that they blame for it, then they vote in someone new. So it's too early to tell how that's going to turn out, I think. I see. And um, do you think uh, that um, whole or most of American people uh, think that uh, Trump um, maybe um, reacted uh, against the pandemic too slowly, uh, so he maybe the measures uh, which were taken were uh, weren't enough so because right. yeah so what do you think Underst all right well first of course uh, even epidemiologists don't know when this is over you can look back and study it and say should have done this year should have done that there um, etc and in, in the united states you know for, for a so-called first world country, the level of education of the, of the population, voting population, is, is really quite low. They may be degreed and, um, you know, they may have uh, various uh, certificates, uh, but their understanding of politics and, you know, so sociology generally, um, you know, economics, is really very, almost primitive, almost childish. Um, so what they think 
of whether Trump should have gone in early or not really isn't based on you know their their understanding of epidemiology um, or of uh, you know politics and law and the things that we you know relate to how to defend against the coming epidemic or pandemic. Rather, there are like two ch two pipelines of information for the blue channel and the red channel, basically. Those who are, support the Republican Party, those who support the Democratic Party, they've been getting the same, you know, stuff fed to them through those channels now for at least five years since going into the last election. Um, despite everything, all the TV channels calling uh, Trump a, a crook and stupid and crazy and everything for three and a half years, the polls pretty much stay the same. People either hate him or they like him, um, or they're indifferent. And that hasn't really changed much um, throughout this whole thing, which is kind of remarkable because, you know, as you know, in Russia, there's some pretty remarkable changes in our daily routines that we're enduring right now to deal with this. And yet uh, there, there doesn't seem to be any uh, measure of a response to that in the polling. Yeah, and uh, all these uh, things which uh, which um, said on Fox News, for example, uh, on the beginning of uh, this week, uh, about uh, a, a zero patient uh, from Wuhan, uh, about um, the China is guilty of that pandemic. Is it? Um, uh, would this happen? Uh, uh, for Trump, so uh, is it um, maybe uh, could this uh, up his rating? What that? Um, I'm no. sorry, I didn't understand. I all, understand this, uh, all this, all uh, this stuff uh, about China is guilty in yeah. the, in pandemic about uh, the virus coming uh, uh, from Wuhan. Uh, so uh, did uh, people uh, believe? in this and uh, is it uh, a plane for Trump administrations? I'm, in other words, are, 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 uh, if it's China's fault, does that absolve Trump in the eyes of Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what uh, did uh, all people uh, so think about That's the intent. You know, it's a public relations, you know, uh, package of images that that it's intended if it's if it's china's fault then it's not trump's fault and trump shut down traffic from china early and trump has been hostile towards china at least publicly so i think it's intended to to, to help him i don't know that it does but i think that's the intent 